in order to learn at any age, most critical thing is that you bring as much focus and active engagement to the learning, the, the encoding of the information, bringing in the information. NSDR, non-sleep deep rest. And this kind of brings us back to focus and, and learning. As I understand it from listening to you a number of times talk about learning and uh, improving our memory and ability to recall and take on new information, there seems to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, two sort of key components. One is the, the, the focus, the sort of application side of learning. And then there's the consolidation of that later in these, these uh, deep uh, sleep-like sort of states or sleep itself. Can you kind of speak to how that all works together? Yeah, and you're exactly right. Um, learning is a two-stage process. And the learning I'm referring to is specifically deliberate learning. You know, children are learning passively all the time. They're taking in new information. Their brain is, it's not a complete tabula rasa. It's not a complete blank slate. There's some hardwired functions they show up with, thank goodness, like breathing, <laughs> like heart rate, uh, heart uh, controlling heart rate. That helps. But that helps. I mean, you know, offload a, the, as much as you can to the genetic program to hardwire the nervous system so they can learn how to walk. And walking is a good example. A, a, a kid learns how to walk and then walks reflexively. But of course, at any stage, you can think about how you're walking. You could do hopscotch and you have to change your cadence of jumping and walking, right? So that, that's this uh, flexible transition between voluntary and involuntary movement, but you have to learn how to walk. And so, but th what we're talking about now is generally deliberate learning, language learning, skill learning, learning knowledge of any kind, um, learning how to, you know, navigate the emotional dynamics of a relationship, well, anything. Two phases. One is active engagement and focus. Uh, much of the trigger for neuroplasticity as a process is engaged by dopamine and norepinephrine and a molecule called acetylcholine, which is liberated from multiple sources. We always talked about how acetylcholine controls the, the, the contraction of muscles, but in the brain, acetylcholine is mainly comes from two sets of neurons, one in the brainstem and another in the basal forebrain. And it serves as a kind of a highlighter marking particular connections or neurons that later stand a chance to become stronger. So let me give an example. I don't speak a second language, but let's say I decided I was going to learn conversational French. I would learn some nouns or some verbs. I would, I would focus on this. And the greater degree of focus that I bring, the greater amount of acetylcholine is released at that time. And at the particular locations in the brain they're involved in enunciating the words and writing the comprehension, you know, multiple spots within the brain. That kind of marks those or flags those areas as potentially changing later. But the actual rewiring of the nervous system happens during states of deep sleep or sleep-like states. And so, it's a, so when we say neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to change in response to experience, that's a two-part process. It's a process. It's not an event. We always think about things as events, but in biology, almost everything is a process. So the, the takeaway from this is in order to learn at any age, the most critical thing is that you bring as much focus and active engagement to the learning, the, the encoding of the information, bringing in the information, and then that you get into a state of deep rest as quickly as possible. Typically, that would be the night after you learn, uh, after you have this trigger. But there are some beautiful studies published in Cell Reports last year and the year before showing that people who take a 20-minute nap within the four hours after these uh, triggering learning or people that do a non-sleep deep rest type protocol, even just sitting there quietly and not doing anything, they learn much faster. In other words, the brain rewires much faster. Isn't that interesting? It's very interesting. And what's happening is very interesting. We've long known that during sleep, there's a replay of the neurons in the same sequence that they were played during the activity in the uh, earlier in that day. Sometimes even backwards for some reason. That it's like the songs played backwards at night. Who knows why? I don't think we should focus too much on that right now. But that replay is the consolidation of the information. You learn. This is why you try something physically. Try it physically. You can't do it. You can't do it. And then you come back a week later and voila, you can do it. The, you had the opportunity to change the neural circuits so that now you can do it. The these non-sleep deep rest or these shallow naps of 20 to 30 minutes also create a replay or a firing of the neurons. But there's an additional tool. So, so what, sorry, I should say there's a tool which is get as focused as you can, 
but then relax as deeply as you for can. For how long? How like if you're going to be focused on something, is there a certain amount of bandwidth we have where it's productive and then it becomes unproductive? Yeah, and it varies for people and some people use pharmacology to override what I'm about to say, but generally after about 90 minutes, what we we exist on these so-called 90-minute ultradian cycles. Everything in sleep is a 90-minute cycle, everything in waking is a 90-minute cycle. If you sit down to work and you're like, "All right, I'm finally doing. I'm going to turn my phone off. I'm going to write this book. You just wrote a book." So um, quite nice book, by the way. I, I enjoyed reading. I'm learning a lot from it. Um, people should read it. Is it out now? <laughs> this is not a promotional thing, like for <laughs> by design. It just, but it's a really, yeah, it's no. good. I learned a lot. There's, I learned a lot of science about nutrition. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, it's meant to. Be, it's in the ocean. Yeah, it's out in Australia. It'll be out. So okay, cool. I think by the time this goes up, it'll be out. Yeah, I learned a lot of nutritional science. Right. I mean, I, I, as you know, I'm not purely plant based, but I'm. I try and eat like it's. Yeah. Uh, no, you're, do, you're doing a great job. I'm trying. I'm trying. Okay, <laughs> um, your audience can can send me some information. He's doing a great job. I'm trying. Trust me. Um, I'm always trying. So, you know, you you read this information, you bring in the information, and then I would for but after about or you're working on the book, and you're, you're like focusing and you're of course you know people think that the expectation is that you're going to be like a beam of focus for 90 minutes that's not the case you can flicker in and out you're going to get distracted you bring yourself back i mean focus is an active process of bringing that spotlight of attention back mm. it's much like, easier without the phone much easier yeah. without the phone much easier using a program called freedom free program online where you can just turn off the internet mm -hmm. um it's i'll tell you it's very painful as you know and yet there's something deeply satisfying about completing one of these 90 minute bouts. You really feel good in your brain and body because we were actually designed to do this. Mm. Um, I it definitely design, feels like a grind at some stage. Oh yeah. And that friction and that uh, anxiety sometimes that we feel is adrenaline. It's, it's supposed to be stressful to learn. It's this idea that we just sit back and learn or that, you know, movies have really destroyed the notion of learning the idea that you're going to like pick up the sword and suddenly have the skills, you know, forget it. It's like, this it doesn't work that way. I mean, it's f friction, 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 friction. And some days are good and some days are worse. If you slept better, generally it's better. People are always trying to optimize how much caffeine, background noise, yes noise, yes music, no music. You have to tweak things according to your circumstances. But you, nine, after about 90 minutes, you should really take a break and let your mind go idle somewhat. Ideally, you would take a 20 minute nap or a 30 minute nap or do a non-sleep deep rest protocol within the first hour to four hours after that. But a lot of us have a lot of demands. You go straight from a 90 minute bout to commuting. Sleep that you get that night is going to be the most powerful tool for wiring the nervous system, right? That's, that's when it really happens. And so we can talk about tools to, to get into deep sleep and stay asleep uh, more if you like. But there's another thing that you can do, which is that there's a beautiful literature on what's called gap learning effects, where let's say, uh, and this has been looked at for physical skill learning, for music learning, math, et cetera where if every couple of minutes just randomly during your intense learning or focus you pause and you just take 10 seconds and do nothing just let your brain idle eyes open or eyes closed doesn't matter what happens is your rates of learning actually increase and the reason is now they've done neuroimaging on this really excellent studies published in great journals show that during those little gaps that you're taking there's a replay of the neurons very fast at something like 10 or 20x the speed that the, normally they would be rehearsing it. So you're getting more repetitions during the, by, by stopping every once in a while. Now you actually have to do the work um, and how many of these to insert and it should be random. So there are some free apps out there where you can set like a random buzzer or just every once in a while while you're writing or trying to do something, you just pause and do nothing. Mm. Where was that tool then, when I was going through school? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think that the, the, the science on this dates back about 20 years, but it's only now that there's an, a, enough of what I call a kind of center of mass around the, these studies that really point to the fact that gap learning effects are really strong. Uh, they're very beneficial. You learn faster. So it's focus, rest, focus, rest, focus, rest. And that can be done on the micro level, like within that 90 minute block. Let's just make up a number for fun so people have something to, to anchor to. If you're going to sit down and do an hour of work let's say for every 60 minutes of focus or learning that you try and do introduce um 30 30 gaps of 10 seconds at random and and truly at random not a, on a regular interval and then sometime later that day if you can do an nsdr non-sleep deep rest and if you can't okay no big deal it, you won't learn as fast but you'll still learn provided that you get into deep sleep that night and you let's say you have a lousy night's sleep you'll still learn but you won't learn as well 
And maybe the next night you stand a chance of encoding that information. So neuroplasticity involves a very strong trigger and then deep relaxation is when the actual rewiring occurs. And there are, are exceptions to this, but I should just mention, because it brings us back to an earlier point, that when you think about the, the tools that people use to enhance focus, Ritalin, Adderall, L-tyrosine, excessive amounts of caffeine, nicotine, those all help with the trigger part, but they don't help with the relaxation part. And so a lot of people don't learn, they just get really good at doing, but they don't actually learn. Uh, so very effective people in regardless of workplace or activity, sport or cognitive work or otherwise, perform very well because they're very good at regulating the seesaw of focus, relax, focus, relax. And in the long term, it also is, is very health enhancing as opposed to health depleting. I mean, it, I know a dozen or more people who have done very, very well in business or academia who are a, a mess. They, I mean, they, they're physically a mess, they're emotionally a mess, they're mentally a mess, their relationships are a mess. People that I you know, consider successful are people that are very successful in multiple domains of life. And that almost always correlates with an ability to engage and disengage, deliberately engage and, and deliberately disengage. Yeah, this is reminding me, although a different setting, uh, but a similar concept of work and then relax. Mm -hmm. uh, back when I was about, uh, gosh, I must have been about 19. I had a, a friend of mine. He's gone on actually. I haven't seen him in about 10 years. His name is Jake Nicolopoulos. You can look him up. He's gone on to be, become a professional bodybuilder. Okay. And when I was uh, 19, I think I was like his first training partner. And he was far, you know, far better than I was at lifting weights. And really, I was just there to spot him. And uh, he had this strategy because he wanted to become a professional bodybuilder from a very early age of working out and then he would sleep under his desk oh. after mm -hmm. <laughs> have a nap during the day. Uh, so different setting, but similar sort of concept or strategy there. Yeah, I think the way to think about it is, you know, that, and thank you, um, Matthew Walker and others who have, have emphasized the importance of sleep. You know, I mean, Matthew it was really kind of first man in on trying to convince the world that this whole idea of you'll sleep when you're dead is really foolish. And uh, listen, I, I think it's a, it's a fact that in order to get good at anything, unless you're just an absolute talent, you need to apply yourself and, and work hard and sometimes work longer and harder than you feel like working or, or is healthy for yourself. I mean, that's, that's a reality. But Matt, I think really pointed out that sleep is important uh, for learning and a number of other aspects of, of health. I think that the, the ability to toggle back and forth between engaged and disengaged states and to see that whole process engage and disengage and the dynamic control of that and deliberate self-control of that, that is a superpower. And we tend to only look at one side of the equation, the leaning in. I always think um, the way I like to think of it isn't so much as a seesaw is you can either be back on your heels, flat-footed or forward center of mass. I stole this from Pat Dawson, the founder of Made For. He did nine years in the SEAL teams. And so I, I like that, that forward center of mass is great, but it's, it's energetically demanding. And you need to learn how to come up to just, you know, flat footed every once in a while. Now, when you're back on your heels, that's a sign that likely you were doing too much time forward center of mass. No one wants to talk about this, but people who grind, 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 rarely succeed and then just take, you know, take off and do something else. I think people, uh, humans have mastered this process of engaging and disengaging on a longer time scale. Work hard, play hard, or they'll take a long vacation. But what I'm talking about doing this is across the day. I'm talking about regulating your nervous system within the unit of the day, or even within the unit of the morning, or within the unit of the afternoon. And I think that that's a much more um, useful, at least to me, a much more useful time bin to conceptualize this. Because the idea that you're gonna, you know, sell the company or launch the thing and then, then you'll rest. Okay, but you can be so much more effective if you know how to dynamically control your nervous system in real time. And great athletes know how to do this. Great musicians know how to do this. Even within the playing of a piece of music or within a race, they know how to reserve energy so that then they can kick at the end. Or in academics, you learn, I was always on the quarter system, which is a 10 week system you learn how to pace yourself through the quarter because otherwise you're coming in screeching at the end and you then to get two weeks off and it's really stressful. You're just trying to recover your health and then you're back into another cycle. So I think one of the reasons that 
I'm not superb at this, but one of the reasons I've been, you know, at least partially successful in maintaining a, a, a laboratory and doing a podcast. And, you know, I like to think you can ask the people in my life, you know, decent, you know, decently effective in my, my personal life is that I think all the time, am I pushing too hard, you know, and there, yes or no. And there are times to lean, go forward center of mass. Don't get me wrong, but this can be done with forward center of mass can be done if you wanted through drinking caffeine, it, um, you know, in the supplements that we talked about earlier, or pharmacology we talked about earlier, the main way to do it is to get in that kind of inspired and motivated pursuit. But then physiological size, non-sleep deep rest, reverie, um, all of that is very useful. But the foundation of that whole process, there's a third layer, which is sleep. When, you've, when you're well rested, you're able to engage this forward center of mass flat footed thing at will much more easily. When sleep suffers, everything suffers. And so I always say, when people are say, come to me and they say, listen, I, I think I have attention deficit or I've got anxiety, I always just say, how's your sleep? You want to always start with sleep. Great sleep makes everything better. And then once that's in place, then you can start thinking about some of the other processes. So you really can't build up a, a sleep debt that you sort of repay later all in one chunk. Well, Matt tells us no, and he's the more qualified sleep researcher. I don't really work on sleep per se, although our studies include measures of daytime sleep disturbance and things like that in the studies we're doing now. But Matt's the guy, and there are others out there too. Of course, Stanford has a sleep clinic, and when I talk to them, they tell me no. However, there is an idea that's sort of growing now that if you can't get enough sleep, because many people can't, shift work, new parents, hardworking students, anxiety-ridden folks, or you just have a bad night or noisy outside, something wakes you up. That's where these non-sleep deep rest protocols and naps come in. Can you recover sleep in its purest form? Probably not. But can you do things that offset some of the damage of limited sleep or maybe place you in a more effective position cognitively and physically? Absolutely. I mean, I, I've experienced that myself, and I think that the neurochemical signatures of non-sleep deep rest point to the fact that those practices really can help you be in a better position. It's sort of like optimal nutrition is, you know, I, I daydream about, go, and I'm sure they're around here, so I just need to work a little harder, get, you know, getting my fruits and vegetables from a local farm, um, drinking the cleanest water out of springs. I mean, this would be wonderful, but that's not my daily life. So I try and do what I can that gets me closer to that, but isn't the ideal circumstance. So I think, um, can you recover sleep debt? Probably not completely. Can you do things to offset it? Absolutely. Is there a little sleep IRS running around that's eventually gonna come around for all the sleep you didn't get? No, that's also, I think Matt would agree with me there. So it, it I think the goal should be that 80% of nights you're getting quality, sufficient sleep. Mm. 